Hi, I'm John Hurwitz, and welcome back to The Sarah O'Connell Show. Welcome to The Sarah O'Connell Show. John Hurwitz, welcome back to The Sarah O'Connell Show. How are you today? I'm great. Great talking to you. The last time we spoke about Cobra Kai Season 1, and we're going to go straight into Season 2 this time, and then stick around because we're going to be talking about Season 3 as well, which is coming very soon. First of all, can you finally reveal to us what your favorite scenes working on in Cobra Kai Season 2 were? Oh, wow. Season 2. It's so funny because it's uh, it all feels so long ago. Uh, right. Overshooting. Too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, uh, you know, I mean, Season 2, I mean, there were so many scenes that I loved working on. I mean, the, the first one that I, I think of always is that finale, uh, the, uh, the, that school fight, yeah. uh, the uh, sort of the, that, that brawl where all of our, our young actors, our teenage actors were, were training for, for weeks ahead of that. They spent their weekends working with our amazing stunt coordinators, uh, Hido Koda and Janelle Kerfman, uh, running the thing over and over again and uh, along with the stunt team. Uh, so uh, th that's the first thing that comes to mind, especially that 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 oneer that we have in there that's over 80 seconds long, um, where uh, the camera is just ke keeps moving as everyone keeps fighting. That's that's the first thing that popped in my head. Yeah, it really is such an epic scene and cinematic rivaling. You know, the best films at this point, which is one thing I love about the series. It, it doesn't hold back it doesn't feel like a watered down version of the karate kids series yeah you know i think we want it to uh be a modern telling you know we, they're the themes that we all loved uh, uh all those years ago with uh with the karate kid um many of those continue uh through till this day whether it's uh you know mentorship or bullying um you know or just you know teenage drama in general uh, but to, to be able to do it in a, in a modern way that has, uh, you know, fun, fun throwbacks to the past, uh, it's, it's been great. Our season one ended with the reveal of John Kreese making his surprise return. Martin Cove has such an incredible presence. What was he like to work with? He's the best. It's so funny because he is, he's a hilarious human being in general. So like he, you know him as this like intense kind of evil kind of character but in real life, he's just very funny and he's very light. He keeps things light on set. Um, so uh, it's fun sort of getting to know the real Marty and there are times where he's like, oh, can, you know, can he be joking around? Can he be doing this? And we're just like, we love Crease how he is and then expand off of that baseline. So I'll say this, like when we're on set and he's delivering some of his monologues, uh, you know, or, or even when he just gives, a, gives a, a look, I'll never forget, you know, a scene in season two, where uh, Dimitri walks into the Cobra Kai dojo thinking, oh, he's going to, you know, uh, give it another shot at, at karate. And he thinks he's going to see Johnny. And then he sees Crease, and he's re just relieved. He feels, oh, OK, you know, thank God it's not the other guy. <laughs> and little does he know he's walking into, uh, you know, a, a person who we know is far worse than Johnny. Yeah. So you know, even just those looks that he gives, uh, uh, Marty doesn't even say a word in those in that entire scene yet his presence is felt in a major way. That's phenomenal. Now there, there's some scenes looking back across the entire series and the next Karate Kid and even the animated series where some of the facts don't quite line up. So in the Karate Kid 2, Mr. Miyagi is called Miyagi Narayoshi and in Cobra Kai it's reversed, so it's Narayoshi Miyagi on his grave. In the next Karate Kid is Keisuke Miyagi and in the 1989 animated series, it's Miyagi Yakima. So yeah, yeah. Is, are there certain times where you just have to sort of pick what you, you think the canon will be and sort of move forward from that point? That's a decision you have to make uh, sometimes when you're, when you're making the show. You know, there were inconsistencies in the past. So, you know, there were a lot of people, you know, when, when they saw the gravestone and, they, and they're like, why isn't it... Uh, uh, why isn't it what you called him in karate, they called him in Karate Kid 4? We're like, well, we actually viewed Karate Kid 2 as more um, meaningful in the canon in terms of, you know, it, it's, you know, it was the return to Okinawa and there was the signage that was held up there that translated for us, you know, uh, was uh, Nariyoshi. So we went with that. Um, but, you know, it's one of those things that like in retrospect, at, since doing that, we learned that that was sort of a choice that was sort of, I think, just made randomly by whoever was in the prop department, probably, right. as opposed to it, it, a lot of thought in there. 
So, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, we, we, you know, maybe made the wrong decision there, but I think the way we've looked at it is that all of these names, maybe not the animated show, but, you know, uh, it's possible that, you know, he's Nariyoshi, Kitsuke, uh, you know, Miyagi, and that all of the names are, yeah. are relevant in one way or another. So in episode six, we have, of course, the entire series is Cobra Kai, but we have the reunion of the original Cobra Kai. What was it like getting those cast members back together and filming that bar scene fight and all that good stuff? That was, it was amazing. Uh, you know, from the beginning of making the show, we've always loved the idea of bringing back characters from the past. And, you know, rather than have everybody show up at once, we wanted these, you know, characters spread out over the course of, of seasons. And, you know, when we were hitting mid season of season two, we thought it was a, a time where, you know, we as an audience are following Johnny's journey and perhaps it would be a good opportunity for him to get some perspective and, you know, reconnect with, uh, you know, some friends from the past. So when filming that, it was amazing because Billy Zapka and that group, uh, which included Rob Garrison and, yeah. and uh, Ron Thomas and, uh, and Tony O'Dell, um, they were all still very close friends. These are, these are people who like, imagine, you know, when you're like a teenager mm -hmm. and you had a group of friends who you spent three or four, you know, intense uh, months with, you know, day in, day out, and this was your group. And then, you know, th th then they continued that relationship. Uh, you know, this, they had the shared experience that they continued all these years. And so they'd see each other, whether it was uh, getting together at family, family barbecues or, you know, having phone calls or keeping in touch through social media or for them conventions and things like that. Those guys had been in touch for all these years. So when Billy got to do the show again, he was always looking forward to that opportunity to kind of reunite that group. And just having them there was so special. The scenes felt so authentic because they all felt the same kinds of, uh, you know, camaraderie and, and past that the characters did. Um, you know, obviously tragically, uh, Rob Garrison ended up passing away within a, a year later, yeah. like his character did. That was not something that was uh, on the horizon at the time. So you, you was, had no idea that was going to happen. And also, when you when you picked that character, did you consider the other ones passing away too, or was it purely a reference to the put them in a body bag thing? It it was it was strictly a reference to get uh, get him a body bag. It, it started with that. We thought, you know, this was. You know, we felt like it was would be meaningful for somebody, uh, a contemporary of Johnny's, to pass away, mm -hmm. um, and and we and we also knew that uh, Rob was a fantastic actor. Billy would always rave about how he may have been the best actor of all of them, in his opinion. So we were like, let's give him something really, uh, you know, strong and meaningful, mm -hmm. and uh, and also there was that meta super dark meta joke of that he said get him in a body bag and it became this like big pop culture thing mm. and let's you know zip him up in a body bag at the end when filming that none of us including rob garrison knew what the, where the future was was going so it was a very um you know it was a, a, a sad day on set in the sense that the actors had to um channel such emotion and they thought about other common friends that they had who maybe they had lost when yeah. they were bringing up when they were channeling that for their performance, but it was a very um, gleeful day on set because everyone enjoyed the reference. And I remember that night uh, we ended up, uh, it was their final day of shooting as a group. And Hayden, Josh and I, uh, along with all of them went out and had some dinner and beers and just told stories for hours and hours and just had laughs. Very similar to what you see on the show. Um. We, got, we got to be the added like flies on the wall or actually flies in, in the mix um hearing the stories and contributing and and it was really special uh having that reunion for all those guys yeah you know the show goes on for lots of years which i really hope it does it's great that they managed to have that moment with you know the original cobra kai members there and the thing i love about the show too is all the characters have, have grown in the years since the original movies and even the cobra kai members have and even though they've moved past that, you know, the past with Crete and all that kind of stuff, they're still very much a unit when they're fighting together. And I just, I just loved that scene. I thought it was brilliant. Oh yeah. Seeing them, uh, you know, fighting as a group was really, really fun. And uh, I remember there was a moment where Tony O'Dell's character uh, is, you know, uh, you know, hits somebody and then like looks at his hands. Like he, like he, like he still <laughs> has that muscle memory. He still has it within him, you know, cause he's, uh, it's been years since he had that experience, but 
yeah, filming that kind of a fight scene uh, with that group, uh, it was a blast. So obviously there's some very famous props in the show, Daniel's yellow car being one of them, and I believe he has a headband as well from the original movies. Is there anything else, there's certain iconic props that sort of come up, such as Mr. Miyagi's Medal of Honor and the, the drum from Karate Kid 2, are they recreations or did any of that stuff survive? Those were both recreations. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we did not have the originals for those, but uh, you know, we have an amazing prop department, and they'll, uh, you know, they'll they'll look at look at stills from uh, you know the past movies and do their best to kind of recreate what they can. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other specific props that we brought back. I I, I feel like they've generally been recreations. Yeah. Uh, since since that. Yeah, because there's that photo of Chris, I guess, in the army when he puts it back up on the wall. I guess he reprinted that. Yes, there was reprinting that. There was also, you know, there was talk of the original, um, you know, Chris stand-up, uh, you know, like uh, the, the the cardboard the version. Of, the, the, yeah, the cardboard version of him yeah. when, when Daniel first walks into the dojo and he sees like the life-size version of Chris. Marty Cove actually owns the original of that. And it, you'll sometimes oh. see like, during interviews that he'll do occasionally, especially during quarantine, he's in his house, so he's filming like <laughs> this. Um, so you'll occasionally see it in the background and he has that, but it's in such terrible shape. It's just like, it's it's falling apart, but it's still yeah. the original, but we have not used that on the show. <laughs> Maybe one day. Maybe one day. Yeah, we'll get an apartment and they'll put it back up and it'll just be falling to pieces. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it'll fall over and tackle a burglar and you'll know it's still got some fight in it, even though it looks worse for wear. <laughs> exactly. I love the idea. Are there any Easter eggs or anything that fans may not have spotted or subtle references that you put into the show that you particularly love? There, we, there are Easter eggs, um, you know, all the time. Uh, it's funny, there have been, been a, a lot of Easter egg videos, so they've, they've got most of what we're, what we're talking about. Uh, looking ahead at season three, there is a, an Easter egg from the cartoon. Oh. So that's sort, of, that's sort of something that we think is sort of special that uh, you know will be a big surprise for people that I don't know how many people are gonna pick up on it, but uh, we did uh, throw an Easter egg there uh, and that was a unique one. Um, but nothing else sort of immediately comes to mind. Like the first one, you know, the body bag, the body bag is one that like we, we, we talk about a lot as, yeah, as a special one, but yeah, it's, it's at this point, uh, you know, people have, have ca caught on to pretty much everything there <laughs> and then some, they've seen, Easter eggs that we didn't even intend to be Easter eggs. Yeah. So amazing. There's a, a scene in season two where Johnny is seemingly having a date in a dojo and it's kind of like a, a fantasy scene that turns out to be a dream. You can very much have Daniel having one where it's animated. He's just in the show. <laughs> Maybe that would All be right. great. I, I, I'd love it if it turns out that that's what that show was this whole time, that it was yeah. just uh, Daniel Russo's psyche and he had this whole world every time he goes to sleep. That's the reality that's going on in his head. Yeah, so the, the actual reality is the cartoon and the dream is Cobra Kai. <laughs> oh, maybe that, maybe that's what yeah. it is. It's well, possible. Dude, I can't wait any longer. We need to talk about season three. The trailer is out. I've been anticipating it for a couple of years now. I saw season two when it first came out in 2019. Season three, where are all the characters? Does it take place immediately after season two finished? Where are they all at? It's very soon uh, after where season two finished. You know, uh, we, we, you know, we talked about this in the writer's room when writing season two and it was, you know, uh, it played itself out when we filmed and then uh, released the show. We kind of exploded our world at the end of season two. Yeah. You know, we, you know, you have, you know, Miguel, who we've all fell in love with as a character and we watched his journey. You saw him get injured uh, in a, in, and who knows where it's going to happen. Robbie's off in, uh, off you know, in the wind, you know, having run away, you know, uh, Samantha was in this, uh, you know, brutal fight as a, as a teenage girl, which, uh, you know, is a, a very traumatic thing yeah. to go through. Um, you know, Johnny and Daniel, who have been well-intentioned in their teachings, you know, one of the things that we talk about with, you know, season two, and as we head into season three is sometimes you feel like you're doing the right thing in life and things don't work out the way that you wanted them to. And the question is, how do you respond to that? And that's that's where all of our characters are at pretty much going into season three. It's figuring out, you know, how do we continue on and, and evolve in the aftermath of the events of that finale? 
It's interesting. So I watch, I mean, I watched the entire season two back today again, just because I thought it was relevant. And it's interesting because all the characters, apart from Chris, who I, I think knows he's being bad and he just enjoys it. I think all the characters are the hero of their own story and they have good intentions. But I think with Johnny and Daniel, they've got so much history between each other and it takes the slightest thing to sort of fracture that relationship again. Yeah, well, that's that's the thing. It's, you know, the, these guys, you'll see sometimes they're just on the verge of kind of getting over the getting over their issues yeah. and then they're 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 dragged back in again and reminded of what they dislike about one another uh but you know I, first of all i do see chris kringle back there behind you yeah uh you know hi yes yeah, so uh, i'm glad that that he made an appearance but you know i would argue that it, it's not <laughs> only uh, it, that it's not just all the other characters but chris himself views himself as the hero of his own story and I think that's something that, you know, as we move into season three, you know, you'll get a little bit more depth, you know, where we leave off at the end of season two, Kreese has taken over the dojo. But, you know, if, if you, when you watch the season closely, you'll, you'll recognize that, you know, he does have love for Johnny Lawrence. He does, yeah. his ideal scenario is returning to the order that he kind of probably used to have in the eighties, where he's in charge of the Cobra Kai dojo and, and Johnny is there right by his side. Yeah. Those were the best of times for him. And I think there was a version of Kreese that maybe could have accepted being kind of like the, the second in command to Johnny's Cobra Kai. But when he saw that Johnny was no longer teaching the true pure philosophies that he believed in, he thought Johnny was making a mistake. Uh, and, and, you know, as he says at the end, you know, of, of season two, um, you know, you know, one day you'll thank me for this. You know, he believes that Johnny is still his student and that he's still teaching him and that Johnny needed to learn a lesson and it's a hard lesson and it's a harsh lesson. But all of the characters on our show, Chris included, believe that they're the hero of their own story. Yeah, because obviously at the end of, the, well, the beginning of the second Karate Kid, he, his knuckles bleed, he uh, loses that confrontation. And then again, in the third one, he always seems to come off ultimately worse in the encounter it seems that everyone else has sort of grown and developed but do you think that Chris is beyond redemption at this point or do you think even he has a sort of glimmer of light in there somewhere you know I think that um it's going to be interesting to talk to you again about about all this after you watch <laughs> season three of course because because I think that um you know people don't just become that guy that he was, you know, when he was, you know, back in the eighties or, or present day who has, you know, those beliefs, that no mercy belief, yeah. you know, why is he that guy? Why did he, uh, you know, uh, develop these philosophies in this form of karate? Um, uh, you know, why did he choose to open up a karate school and, and, and teach a bunch of young people what he's teaching them? You know, these aren't exactly the, you know, when you choose to be a teacher, there's a reason for it sometimes. And yeah. it's because you, you believe strongly in your ideology. So, you know, I think that, you know, as we go forward, perhaps we'll get to know a little bit more about Kreese and understand kind of where he's coming from and why he believes the way that he does. Um, and that may help, uh, you know, answer these questions going forward. Interesting. So we may learn more about his past in season three as well. Yes. I think it could just be that he designed the logo a long time ago and he's really committed to it. I think so. I think it's just, you know, he likes he likes cobras. What, what can he say? That makes sense. So in the Karate Kid Party, they go to Okinawa, but they didn't actually went to Hawaii. Whereas in Cobra Kai season three, you're actually finally going to go to actual Okinawa. What was that experience like? You know, it was, uh, unfortunately, I didn't get to attend Okinawa. Yeah. It, it was one of those things, you know, we were making the show, we were still on those, the YouTube budget. Right. Um, and uh, so- I can uh, relate to did, that. Yes, you can relate <laughs> to that, you know what that's like. So yeah, we did, uh, you know, uh, uh, some of our cast members and uh, a, a small crew uh, went overseas. Hayden Schlossberg, uh, one of our partners, went over there. I, retur I returned uh, home to my family and uh, got to enjoy some family time while he was in Okinawa and spent some time in the editing room. But, uh, you know, the experience for them, uh, you know, speak, speaking, you know, specifically for Ralph Macchio, it was really magical for him because he was somebody who, you know, has this, this, this franchise means so much to him and he loved it filming in, in Hawaii, but he's been identified with Okinawa and Miss yeah. Miyagi's homeland for so long that we felt that, 
if we're going to be telling this story again and we could somehow pull it off and swing it, we really wanted to film there for real this time. So, uh, you know, they went over there. The weather didn't exactly cooperate at times. And they there didn't was have the original. That was a massive storm. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, there, there were challenges that, uh, that they went through uh, while filming, but I think the results are, are beautiful. Now, some of the Karate Kid 2 characters return. When did you first have the idea of bringing them back and when did you get in contact with them? So, you know, our, our intentions from the very beginning of creating the show were, were to bring these characters back, you know, slowly but surely over the course of seasons. Mm -hmm. um, we, we realized, you know, with where we left things in season two with Daniel, that, you know, it's, you know, he's giving up karate, like he thought he was doing the right thing, teaching, you know, uh, Mr. Miyagi's philosophies going forward. And, you know, you saw the results. So, you know, as we find him in, in season three, you know, his life is kind of in, you know, uh, it's been disrupted in a variety of ways. And, you know, he's still, he's trying to figure things out. So, you know, we thought that, you know, I won't get into how he ends up there or what, what the scenario is, I but, imagine you know, a uh, Yes, exactly. You know, he, he did see swim. <laughs> he, he swims there. That's the training. Exactly, exactly. But no, he, uh, you know, our, our thought was that these were characters that were very meaningful in Daniel's life and meaningful to the audience as well. Mm. Um, the actors were fantastic then. They're fantastic now. Uh, so, um, you know, we felt that season three was the right time to bring them in. And uh, we reached out to them um, in advance that, you know, once we had, once we decided to write these characters in and we had, uh, you know, scripts going, we first, you know, reached out to just confirm that they had an interest in returning. We had already heard that both of them were interested in returning. So that was not something we were nervous about. Uh, but then it was about sort of speaking with them creatively. And uh, once we had scripts, we submitted the, we gave them the scripts and let them know as we do to all of our actors that, you know, this is a starting point. Uh, and it's a conversation, especially for characters that you know, actors have lived with for over three decades, mm -hmm. you want to make it a collaboration. And it was, it was amazing working with both of them. Tamlin, who actually originally ca came from Okinawa, uh, oh, wow. has such, is so proud of her heritage. And, you know, when she showed up in Atlanta where we filmed a number of the Okinawa scenes, um, she brought with her all sorts of, of, of props and, and uh, uh, potential things that we could use in our set design, things that were very specific uh, to uh, the Okinawan culture. Yeah. So that was that was amazing. And then working with uh, with Yuji on Chosen, um, you know, we 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 learned sort of uh, the layers in in the character that he had in his own head, uh, but also the kind of versatile performer that he could be. Fantastic. I know that there seems to be some kind of confrontation happens or training happens, I suppose. And we don't know what the, the situation is, but I'm very much looking forward to seeing that. And can you tell me, is the entire season set in Okinawa or is it like a couple of episodes go there? Uh, only a, a portion of the season is in Okinawa. Right. Um, you, know, mo uh, you know, most of our characters are not traveling there um, and Daniel has plenty to do in, in the Valley as well. So, you know, we, we spend a little bit of time in Okinawa, um, but it's, uh, you know, there's, there's you know, uh, this season is a very big season. You know, we expand yeah. to Okinawa. We have other sort of big things that go on in season three that uh, that you know take us uh, take us beyond the valley. It's very intriguing. And so you, you mentioned that we might learn more about Crete. Will we also find out more about Mr. Miyagi and his past? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, one of the, the the challenges of the show and you know, we're all very sad that we don't have, you know, Pat Morita with us because mm. he's the heart and soul of the Karate Kid franchise. I mean, without him and that relationship that that Miyagi and Daniel LaRusso had, you know, none of us would be here talking about this movie and now TV show all these years later. Uh, but, you know, it's been important to us from the beginning and certainly to Ralph Macchio that we honor Pat Morita's legacy and Miyagi continues to be a big part of our story. So, you know, in, in, uh, you know, going back to Okinawa, uh, it allows us an opportunity to get to know um, that character even further. I think with shows like The Mandalorian doing so well, they now have several spin-offs. We may, it'd be good to see like an Okinawan spin-off in the future and wherever else you go, you know, you could have a Cobra Kai verse or something. 
you never know. It's it's funny. Uh, we uh, we talk all the time about mm -hmm. expanding the universe. You know, whether it's you talk about the Star Wars universe, or even for us, like a show like Breaking Bad that we loved so much that yeah. you know, after all these years, then they, we had Better Call Saul and we have El Camino. You know, we think about uh, all the different ways that you know we could explore these characters and the, and the Miyagi verse um, as uh, as deeply as we can. That sounds very intriguing, and I'd certainly love to see perhaps a younger Mr. Miyagi and Sato and Chozan and all those people, you know, in the past as well. I think it would be very intriguing to watch. Perhaps one day. Now, I've probably tweeted you about this about a thousand times over the years, trying to get you to reveal something you probably know I'm about to ask you. At the end of season two, in the final shot, Johnny's phone is in the sand and he gets a friend request from Ali Mills Schwarber, as she now is. Can you tell us, can you give us any hint? Can you nod? Can you <laughs> do anything like that that might indicate that we may see a return of Ali with an eye, Elizabeth She? I cannot give you an answer on that. Uh, you know, you'll have to keep watching the show to find out if and when she may return. Um, you know, we did end the season that way. Uh, yeah. I'll tell you that when we filmed that, we did not have her attached to the show. Right, um, wow. So it, w it wasn't something that we filmed uh, knowing which way it would it would end up. Um, you know, and when because we filmed it when we filmed it that way, we had ideas as to um, a lot of different ways that you could go from that moment. That would be interesting. But, uh, yeah. you know, I just encourage you to keep watching the show if you like. Uh, if you like that character, then you know maybe you'll get a chance to see her again. It's an intriguing idea, isn't it? I could announce at the end of this that the next episode will have Arnold Schwarzenegger in it and then just try and make that happen afterwards. <laughs> That's the move. That's what you should yeah. do. So I love that. So before I move on from that, though, there's a shot in the trailer where Johnny is wearing a white jacket and it looks like a very familiar Encino Oaks country club. Could you confirm if he's there? I don't confirm anything. I can't confirm that <laughs> kind of stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, he looks fantastic, I'd say. It's a good yeah. jacket. It's a good look for him. So be probably the best look Johnny's had on the show. Absolutely. So, uh, Does he yeah, get any spaghetti so. down him or anything like that in that scene? Or? Uh, well, maybe. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll have to see. We'll, we'll see. You know, he's, he's wearing white. You know, when you're wearing white, it's, yeah. it's a dangerous thing. that Anything could happen. It's very true. I feel like it could be in the white ballpark of that one. And now... Perhaps a more important question, going back to the, the first Karate Kid at the very beginning, Daniel is leaving his ex, his beloved Judy in New Jersey. And there's a scene a bit later on where he says that Ali buries Judy. Could that happen in the future? Could we see Ali versus Judy? You know what? It depends on how many seasons we get to make this show. <laughs> and we may be we may be grasping at straws at some point and, and that may be... Uh, you know, the, uh, the title card, uh, that may be, uh, you know, a future, the, uh, the over, uh, over 18, uh, karate tournament. We'll see, uh, if, uh, that becomes a, a, a big match in the Valley. Yeah. It's a more of an obscure quote than the body bag one, I think. Yes, exactly. <laughs> now in season two, Daniel reveals to his class that he actually used to be in Cobra Kai himself and for the first time references, the third movie. Of course, there's been interactions online and Zoom chats with the entire cast getting back together, including the cast of Karate Kid 3. So obviously you're all in contact, even just in general. Is there a chance that they could be in there as well, or would that be something for the future? You know, any character that's been in the Miyagi-verse has a potential to, uh, you know, return on our show. Um, you know, uh, as I've said, like, you, you know, there are characters that are beloved from the past. And, mm. you know, I think our desire would would be for many of them to return in the series. It's really just about finding the right opportunity, the right the right moment where it feels like it's relevant to the present day story. Um, so, uh, again, kind of like with Ali, you'll just have to keep watching. I will. I'll make a note. Keep watching Cobra Kai. Yes, <laughs> maybe that. that, that yeah, you're not going to do it otherwise. You must I, know, right? I, I think the day that Cobra Kai was first announced back in 2017 or something, I probably messaged you that day. <laughs> it's very in, possible. In a state of constant readiness since about 1985 or something. I'm like, okay, here we go. 
<laughs> well, this this must be a fun time for you. I know it's a fun time for us with, uh, you know, the world discovering the show at a much bigger level than we were experiencing a couple years ago when we spoke. So uh, it's yeah. uh, it's a fun time. And I love that, that when it, it moved from YouTube to Netflix, and it was, you know, number one again, and people were rediscovering it, and it was trending. What's that reaction be like and just having this whole new audience that are discovering the show for the first time? It's, it's surreal. It's one of those things where you make a show, you know, when, when we conceived of the show, it, we thought of it as a Netflix show, to be honest. Um, we happened to sell it to YouTube because they were so aggressive in their pursuit and their commitment to making a full season before we had even written a word. And working with them was fantastic. But, you know, it, when, when the premieres happened, we felt that, that it was big and we felt like there was a big audience and everyone was enjoying it. Yet you'd walk around in your everyday life and there were plenty of people who had no idea that the show existed. People who were big fans of The Karate Kid and didn't yeah. know about it. You know, friends of my wife, friends of my own who, you know, had no clue. And certainly, even if they knew about it, weren't ready to go watch it on YouTube Premium. Yeah. Uh, so... Uh, you know, we always, you know, fantasized about a day when, you know, it would, you know, maybe be on a Netflix down the road years from now, and people would discover it and be like, oh, my God, this thing was made that was that was fantastic. And that it was just for me. Um, and to be able to do this, um, you know, when we finished filming season three, you know, we knew while making season three that YouTube was, you know, undergoing some changes and that there was a possibility that they would let us know that they're not making more scripted shows. So we were prepared when they told us, hey, listen, we're going to put out season three. We're going to go out with a bang. We were, prepared, we were prepared within that phone call to say thank you for everything that you've done and all this. But, you know, we've been wanting to tell the story for longer. Please give us the opportunity to move it. So when we got to move the show over to Netflix and the, the reaction has been really fun because we got to see seasons one and two, which are all material that's been out there for a while, you know, uh, blow up in the, around the world as if it's a new show. Mm -hmm. uh, so season three is going to be really exciting because now all the OG fans like yourself who've been, you know, waiting for a long time now to see it like us have been waiting to show it to you um, and all the new fans together, we're all going to get to experience it uh, very soon. Yeah, because the last season was released in 2019. So there's been a good amount of time since, and I know obviously you've filmed season three, but has that given you a sort of head start to be able to plan further ahead because you're, you're not just doing it, filming it and then releasing it and then have to start writing it. There's been this nice gap for you. Yeah, you know, we've, we've been working on other projects in between um, mm -hmm. as well because uh, we didn't know for sure that we would have a season four. But the moment that uh, it became crystal clear that we had the season four, we took out, you know, all of our notes that we had been gathering because uh, we never stopped talking about it and then got serious about it. So as of right now, we've, we've written most of season four already as a group. Um, and uh, we're, uh, you know, hoping to be back in production uh, early next year. Fantastic. And has obviously coronavirus has affected everything, but had you finished filming season three when the coronavirus pandemic started? We had finished filming it and we had finished editing it. Um, there were like a couple little touches. I remember the last, you know, we had to pick up, uh, you know, some ADR, you know, some random wild lines from people. Uh, at the very start of, of COVID. Uh, so, you know, some of it was done, you know, whether it's through on somebody's phone or go to a, you know, an empty stage and wipe down and all that stuff when we're all sort of scared and figuring things out. But the show is pretty much done, um, well, in advance of all of it. And has Chris finally met his match with Amanda? He confronts him in one scene and hits him across the face and wasn't even able to block it. Huh. One of my favorite things about season three is taking characters that you've seen before and yeah. mixing it up and having them with characters that, you know, they've, they've never been paired with before. And, uh, you know, Court Courtney Hangler has become one of our favorite actors on the show. She's absolutely hilarious. She's one of our, uh, you know, uh, favorite performers on, on camera, but just, you know, on set as well. And uh, we thought it, there was something that would be really... Uh, enjoyable about having her sh uh, share some screen time with Martin Cove and have some Amanda Kreese interactions. So uh, 
that slap is something that we enjoyed very much and you know perhaps there's more to see and i noticed during the very same scene in the background there is a snake possibly a cobra can you tell me does the snake have a name or will it remain nameless like baby yoda was for quite a long time uh, you'll 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 have to watch the show to see if uh, there is a there's a name for the snake uh, but uh it's uh, the, the snake isn't just uh, window dressing there. It does come into play. Interesting. Are there any scenes in any fight scenes in season three that rival that epic school battle at the end of season two? I would say definitely. I would say there is, there's some amazing fight scenes. I won't get into the specifics of it, but I feel like, you know, you may think that you've seen the best fight scene of the season and then maybe there's another, okay. you know, so. I'm very much looking forward to it because there, there were loads in season two in the food courtyard, great fight and, you know, several sort of passionate ones too where Daniel was looking for his daughter at Johnny's house and, you know, there was these sort of closed one-on-one -on -one encounters and then these massive brawls that happened too. Yeah, we have a mix of, the, of a variety of different kinds of fights throughout the season. Yeah. Will there be any reimaginings of any more classic songs such as Cruel Summer Wars? We do talk, we talk about it a lot and we think about it. I'm trying to remember, I don't, offhand, I'm not remembering uh, uh, anything like that in season three. I mean, we do tend to have songs return from the original uh, movies. And so there, you may be able to look forward to some more of that. Um, but, uh, you know, well, well, I don't want to spoil anything further. <laughs> I, I love the soundtrack anyway. It's a great mix of nostalgia and you know new music as well. I think it's fantastic. Now, also very recently released is the Cobra Kai video game. Did the team have much involvement with the production of that? How did that come about? You know, that was one of those things that you know we we have these meetings periodically with uh, the Sony um, merchandise team, and we talk about you know our open mindedness to all kinds of things. And the video game has been in development for a while now. I mean, it was probably a couple of years. It takes a while for those to come together. Yeah. Um, and we said from the beginning that we wanted to have involvement w w uh, in it. So there was a long stretch of time where we're getting many emails a day with different designs of characters and different scripts. Uh, and, you know, the guys and I will look over things, but, you know, some of our other writer producers on the show, uh, Michael Jonathan Smith, Joe Pirulli, Luan Thomas, uh, they took a very active uh, role in that as well. So looking over the scripts that were submitted and throwing out ideas uh, to take some of the load off of our, our off of us. And those guys play play uh, some more video games than we do. So uh, it was good to get their expertise as well. And it's a fun game if people aren't familiar with it. It's kind of like an 80s retro Double Dragon arcade game. So check it out if you get the chance. I think it's on Xbox, PlayStation, Nintendo Switch as well. Yes, yes. No, it's... Uh, it's a lot of fun. Now, Josh Gad very recently just reunited not only the cast of Cobra Kai and Karate Kid 1 and 2, but also 3 as well. That was an epic show to watch. I, don't, I rarely plug other people's shows, but it was for Action Against Hunger as well, raising money for charity, which is phenomenal. How did that come about? What was the coordination like getting that many people into one Zoom? It started with... Um... Josh Gad is uh, a friend of some of ours. Uh, you know, Josh Field, who you know is one of my co-writers on the show. Uh, he made a movie many years ago with Josh Gad. It was like Josh Gad's first movie. It was Josh Field's first movie. It was something that that you know was, had a problematic production. It was very challenging and didn't end up uh, you know coming out in theaters and it's out on DVD. But they became friends way back when. And, you know, Hayden and I met with Josh. After then, I now uh, you know actually. My children go to the same school as Josh's children, so we, you know, I, I coach the softball team that had one of Josh's daughters. Right. So, you know, we've uh, we've all been in touch for a long time. So, Josh reached out uh, and asked, "Hey, would we be interested in doing this?" We thought it was a fantastic idea, so we looped in the team at at Netflix, and they got involved in coordinating. And you know, everyone in the Karate Kid universe kind of know, like, you know, we know most of them by now, but those that we don't know. Where they're you know usually just a, a quick message away on social media, or others are you know friends of friends, so they're able to kind of re do the outreach. But it was a, a coordinated effort, and it was a, a total blast. Now I ask every guest this question: Can you tell me a fun fact about you? Something we may not know. It can be a hobby, a party trick, something like that. Huh. Fun fact about me: 
Um, I would say that when I was a kid, mm -hmm. I was an obsessed baseball card collector. Okay. And when I, when I was 12 years old, I started a baseball card mutual fund where I sold a hundred shares of stock for $2 each to friends and family and bought and sold baseball cards with it and doubled <laughs> everyone's money in a year. Oh, wow. So that's, that's a weird random fact about me, but it, it helped me get into to college. I wrote one of my college essays about it. I went to, uh, the, uh, the UPenn, the Wharton School. Um, I was actually a classmate of Donald Trump Jr. Oh, wow. There's, a, there's yes. an accolade for you. <laughs> exactly. So my <laughs> education is clearly a valuable one. Absolutely. And the great thing is, too, if you ever want, you, if we get to Cobra Kai season five, if Netflix won't pay for it, you know that you can raise the money with the baseball cards. Of course. Exactly. <laughs> Now, can you tell me what you're working on next, apart from obviously Cobra Kai season three, which you'll be promoting and season four, which is going into production soon. There was talk that you had uh, multiple sort of projects deal with Sony Pictures Television. Can you tell us about any of those projects? Yeah, so uh, Hayden, Josh and I have a company called Counterbalance Entertainment, where we make other film and TV shows. Yeah. Uh, we have a movie that we, that we produce that is in post-production right now called Plan B which is about two, teen two teenage girls uh, who are, in, who are uh, living in America's heartland. Um, one of them has a regrettable first sort of sexual encounter and is in need of the plan B pill. So it's uh, the two of them are on an adventure uh, trying to secure that pill um, in a very conservative part of the United States. Uh, so that's a movie that we have that's gonna be coming out on Hulu in 2021. Um, you know, there's another project that uh, we've been working on for a while called Obliterated. Uh, that was the project that we were uh, gearing up to go shoot before the pandemic. Uh, but the pandemic sort of, you know, uh, kind of killed that project for in the short term. But, uh, you know, we're in the process of bringing that back to life and, uh, you know, hope, hoping that uh, in uh, 2021 or uh, we may be getting back into production on that. Uh, and, uh, you know, to come out probably in 2022. Uh, but we're developing a variety of other movies and TV shows, some of which we've, you know, sold and have not been announced yet. Um, and others that are, you know, in the marketplace. But, uh, you know, going forward, you know, we love Cobra Kai. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's always going to be a, a show that we have our eyes very firmly on as we continue to make uh, going forward. But, you know, we're hoping to make other entertainment that's crowd pleasing and and enjoyable and and uh, shows uh, protagonists that you know you don't always get to see and adventures that you don't always get to see going forward. I'm very much looking forward to learning more about them because I mean I've said this to you before. Cobra Kai is genuinely my favorite TV show, and I'm looking forward to seeing more of it and more of the stuff that you're working on too. Well, thank you very much. I think you're going to enjoy it. <laughs> I must ask you, a very long time ago, I think you were attached to another American Pie movie in like 2012. Could that still happen? You know, it, it's, you know, so we made American Reunion, which right. was an incredible experience. I loved making that film. Mm. Um, you know, in the, in the wake of that, you know, for a brief moment, it looked like we were going to make another one. Yeah. But, you know, at Universal Pictures, you know, the, the, the budgets on those movies got a little bit kind of out of control. Uh, you know, with uh, the participation, the profit participation for everybody yeah. uh, and sort of, uh, you know, sort of where it was headed. So Universal sort of took a step back from that. We still love that franchise. We still love those actors. We love those stories. So it's always possible that we'll return again and, and make another one of those films. But there's nothing in, in immediate development uh, for that. Finally, have you got any messages for people watching the Sarah O'Connell show and of course your fans around the world? Uh, I don't know, can you hear my dog barking in the background? Yeah, right of course, that's no? a special surprise guest at the end of yeah. the season finale. Yes, exactly. So uh, <laughs> I think my dog, Martini Baguette Hurwitz, is, uh, is eager for uh, everybody to keep watching the Sarah O'Connell show. Yeah. Uh, you do, you're one of my favorite interviewers that uh, I speak with. Uh, you're always thorough and, uh, and funny. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, they should keep watching your show and keep watching what we have ahead uh, with Co in Cobra Kai and beyond. Well, thank you. That means the world to me. And thank you for returning to my show. And of course, you're very welcome back, obviously, when season three is being released and season four and hopefully season 15 and the Miyagi verse, the animated <laughs> episode and all that good stuff, too. Uh, excellent.
All right. Well, it's a pleasure. <laughs> thank you. And thank you to everybody watching at home. Be sure to share, subscribe, give this video a big thumbs up and leave lots of lovely comments. We'll see you all again soon for another episode of the Sarah O'Connell Show. Bye. That was really fun. It's great speaking with you again. And uh, yeah, you know, uh, yeah, keep kicking ass with your show. <laughs>